Hey everyone, welcome back to the Alberta Roundup. I'm your host, Rachel Emanuel. Thank you for joining me for so many episodes this year. For our final episode of the year, we're going to hold true to our name and do a roundup of the best political stories in Alberta of 2022. Starting at the bottom with number 10, Alberta is back in the black. You all right remember that the province's mid-year November fiscal update revealed that Alberta is forecasting a $12.3 billion surplus for 2022 to 2023. High oil and gas prices contributed to a total revenue of $76.9 billion. Now, to be fair, the 2021 to 22 fiscal year forecast a surplus of $511 million. And it ended the year with a $3.9 billion surplus. But we didn't know that until February. So it's been a positive year for Alberta's books. Number nine on the list, Alberta ends all remaining COVID-19 restrictions. After over two years of restrictions like lockdowns, quarantines, mask mandates, and vaccine coercion, Dina Hincha announced that people who tested positive for COVID-19 would not be mandated to quarantine anymore as of August 19. The province also said that Albertans with COVID symptoms will not be asked to get tested, but to stay home until they feel better. At the time, Premier Jason Kenney said it's time to think differently about COVID-19. Quote, we have to get used to the fact that cases no longer equal high levels of hospitalizations or fatalities. Our focus is on vaccines instead of restrictions as the most scientific response. Then again, for those of you who are still keen to remember those COVID Christmases, lots of my followers, I'm sure, you need look no further than our federal government for some COVID paranoia. Number seven on the list. I know you guys want to forget about this story, but I'm not going to let you just yet. In late July, Albertans were shocked to learn that the province's then chief medical health officer, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, received an almost $228,000 COVID bonus. That's in addition to her almost $365,000 salary. That's well over half a million dollars, marking the largest cash benefit payout of any provincial civil servant. At the time the story broke, Ministry of Health spokesperson Mark Fettelbush said the bonus is a response to the extraordinary additional work from Hinshaw during the pandemic. The bonus covers her overtime hours, though the department did not reveal how much overtime she worked. At the time, then-leadership candidate Danielle Smith said Albertans were rightly outraged and stunned by news of the COVID bonus. She said, quote, As Premier, not only will we not lock down again or impose vaccine mandates, we will have a full review into the handling of the pandemic, including the role our Chief Medical Officer of Health played in it. And as you guys know by now, Smith made good on that promise and Hinshaw was fired as Alberta's Chief Medical Health Officer in mid-November. Number six on the list, the Alberta Sovereignty Act becomes law. We have talked so much about this piece of legislation this year. Smith's Sovereignty Act legislation, or the Alberta Sovereignty Within a United Canada Act, passed in mid-December, just 10 days after being tabled. This was a huge deal for the new premier, who proclaimed throughout the United Conservative Party leadership race that Sovereignty Act legislation would be her first bill as premier. The government says Bill 1 would allow the province to stand up to federal government overreach and interference in areas of provincial jurisdiction, including private property, natural resources, agriculture, firearms, regulation of the economy, and delivery of health education and other social programs. Number five on the list. I'm just going to say it. This is my favorite news story of the year. In December, the Alberta government recommended prosecutors don't pursue charges against firearms owners whose guns were deemed illegal under the Trudeau government's 2020 order and council. A release from the government reads, while respecting operational independence on individual cases, the new protocol issued by the Attorney General provides prosecutors with guidance on how to evaluate the public interest when determining whether or not to pursue charges. Justice Minister Tyler Shandro says Albertans should not automatically be considered criminals because they own a firearm that was legally purchased and possessed. All right, guys, number four on the list. You guys were very eager to hear all the updates on this all year long. Do you remember when a sitting MLA faced criminal charges? Court documents show that Mounties were initially considering criminal charges against an Alberta legislature member who admitted to hacking a government health website. Former NDP MLA Thomas Dang was charged in June under the province's Health Information Act for illegally attempting to access private information contained in the Alberta Health Vaccine Portal. As I've previously reported, Dang has been sitting as an independent MLA since the RCMP began investigating his activities. And for hacking the province's COVID-19 vaccine records, Dan was ordered to pay a $7,200 fine earlier this month. Dang has said he does not plan to seek re-election in the spring 2023 vote. Okay guys, number three on the list. The Alberta government ordered the RCMP to ignore federal confiscation orders earlier this year. On September 23, the Alberta government announced it will take action to prevent Ottawa from conscripting Alberta RCMP officers 
to collect firearms. You guys know the details of this by now. In May 2020, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced he was banning more than 1,500 models of firearms, including AR-15s. Shandro said Federal Public Safety Minister Marco Mendicino then asked the provinces to help confiscate 30,000 newly restricted firearms beginning in the fall. But Shandro said those firearms were purchased legally and the province will not aid the federal government in confiscating them. He said, quote, Alberta taxpayers pay over $750 million per year for the RCMP, and we will not tolerate taking officers off the streets in order to confiscate the property of law-abiding firearms owners. Okay, guys, number two on the list. This was a shock to me. Jason Kenney announced he was resigning as premier. On May 18th, the United Conservative Party had an event in South Calgary to hear the results of Kenny's leadership review. You guys might remember Kenny did survive that review, but just barely, with 51.4% of the vote. I was there and the crowd erupted with cheers when it was announced that Kenny had passed. But those cheers immediately turned to gasps when Kenny said he would step down once a new leader is chosen. Until that point, Kenny had said he would stay on as leader if he reached over 50% of voter support. But no political leader in Canada has stayed on with so little support from within their own party. In late November, Kenny stepped down as a member of the Legislative Assembly for Calgary Lougheed. He said, quote, Thank you to my constituents for the honour of representing them in Parliament and the Legislature over the past 25 years. Of course, guys, with Kenny resigning, that made room for someone new. Despite the sitting Premier's criticism of her during the leadership race, Danielle Smith pulled off a victory and won the leadership contest on the sixth and final ballot, with 53.8% of the vote. Okay guys, and number one on the list is of course the Coots border blockade. On January 29, the Freedom Convoy rolled into Ottawa and a group of truckers blockaded the Sweetgrass Coots border crossing. That's one of the busiest ports of entry west of the Great Lakes. The United States Department of Agriculture's Food Safety and Inspection Service is located at this crossing, making it a principal point of entry for Alberta's large meat industry. Protesters demanded an end to all COVID-19 restrictions. On February 12, due to ongoing protests, the Canada Border Services Agency suspended all travel at the Coote border crossing. Just two days later, the RCMP stepped in and arrested 13 people, seizing long guns, handguns, body armor, a large amount of ammunition, and high-capacity magazines. Four men were subsequently charged with conspiracy to murder RCMP officers. Fort McLeod town councillor and organizer Marco Van Hoogenbos later testified at the Emergencies Act inquiry, saying it was time to go because there was nothing left to stay for after those guns were found. He said, quote, To me, it became very clear that every objective we were looking to achieve was no longer possible and that our message had been lost. The border crossing was reopened on February 15th. Okay, guys, so that's Alberta Politics 2022 wrapped. Thank you so much for supporting me and watching my show and reading our work over at True North. If you'd like to support independent media, you can visit donate.tnc.news. Thank you so much and see you guys next year.